Hello, this is Deborah Tavares with StopTheCrime.net. This is a meeting that we're attending right now in Sonoma County, specifically in Santa Rosa, where we have experienced historical loss of property value and the highest cost for recovery than anywhere in the nation's history. The fires that roared through our community starting October the 8th of 2015. These are recovery programs that we are now attending. They are diabolical. They're asking for zero net energy and rebuilds. Nothing is nothing. We don't exist in a vacuum. Zero is not possible. And yet they're advocating for that. But I'm going to go over the agenda for this evening's meeting and we will uh, cover this further as you continue to listen to this YouTube. It's about conservations around the fire rebuilding in a fire ecology. And today is Monday, it is January the 22nd of 2018. And it is important to understand that we have been invited to join in an evening of information sharing to address the daunting questions about rebuilding in a fire ecology and engaging support for a resilient recovery. We're gonna talk about resilient shortly, but it is diabolical. They're going to talk about how, how do we thoughtfully and creatively uh, live in a cooperatively uh, and in a fire ecology? What resources exist to help us? And how can we learn from our past? The speakers are going to include, now I understand that a couple of these speakers are out with the um, weaponized biological flu which of course you can look at flu, biological, weaponized attack. That's a YouTube we have up. So several of these speakers are out with that flu. But the speakers were to include uh, the Santa Rosa City Council member on the role of, social go of local government. Again, the city councilwoman on the role of local government. Also a staff attorney uh, for United Policyholders on Navigating Insurance Claims. There will be a speaker uh, from Sonoma County on support of the victims of Rebuilding Green. There also will include a discussion on permaculture, native land management practices, and development in fire-prone areas, followed by another speaker on historical planning for Sonoma County. This is resilient planning. This is heading to all of you across the country and globally. And we will expand upon that after we film this uh, speech and these talks this evening. There will also be a person from the Greenbelt Alliance on a resilient rebuild and recovery that reduces fire risk and on ideal locations for new housing. Again, this is Deborah Tavares with StopTheCrime.net reporting on the scene of another crime. Uh, my name is Lindsay. I'm the pastor here at Christ Church United Methodist. We're so excited to have you here this evening. This is an important conversation we need to be having. We are the people who need to be having it. The time to have it was about how, well, the conversation about housing, the time to have it was probably about six or seven years ago, but we're really glad that we're having the conversation right now. I'm glad that you took this time out of your busy life to be present here. Just to welcome you and to give you a few bits of information you should have. So we have uh, men's and women's designated restrooms here. Uh, you'll go back and to the right. Uh, we have non-designated as men's and women's gender neutral restrooms out. In the breezeway, there's a, a kitchen, there's food in the back, and uh, there's some beverages as well. You should feel free uh, that you can, you can eat here, um, and also feel free to clean up after yourself when you're done. <laughs> um, as we're going to be in, we're kind of in a tight space, this is actually the space at capacity, and so there could be some rules for engagement that will make this evening more fun for everyone. First of all, really, actually try to turn off your your phone and turn off the vibrate function on it too because you think that nobody hears it when your phone vibrates but we do 
you actually can still hear other people's phones vibrating against chairs. So if you can make the phone silent, that would be great. If you can um, be respectful of the people who are talking, so we have great speakers who are here this evening, each of whom is going to present for five or ten minutes. Then the next speaker will present in the next and the next. After that, we'll have questions and answers. So if you have a, a burning question you want to ask someone, just feel free to keep it. And during question and answer time, you'll have the opportunity to ask it. Um, I'll ask you now, and they'll remind you later, that when it's time for questions and answers, please ask a question. And don't disguise a comment in the form of a question. Ask a, a question. We want to make sure that everybody gets a chance uh, to share and engage this evening. So let's make space for that to happen. And now, if we are ready to begin, we're going to take a moment and, and center ourselves. I call it prayer, but you'll call it whatever you want it to. Uh, take a moment and let's get present in this space. And if you have been a lot of places today, I'll give you a moment to get here. We'll take a moment to acknowledge that, that the ground that we're on does not belong to us. That it was Ill illegitimately taken from the people who were here first. Take a moment to acknowledge that life is a gift that all of creation is a gift to us and that we have not been good stewards of it. So we open our hearts and our minds We ask that this evening be an opportunity to grow in compassion and wisdom. And we may be the people through whom a society of <coughs> justice and peace will be built. Good evening. Thank you for being here and thank you, Lindsay, for that welcome. Um, my name is June Bershares and I'm with the groups that helped co organize tonight's event the Green Party of Sonoma County, the Action Coalition. Sonoma County, the Peace and Justice Center of Sonoma County, and the uh, Social Concerns Task Force of Christ Church United Methodist. And we thank Christ Church United Methodist for hosting us here tonight. Um, tonight's event, Conversations Around the Fire, Rebuilding in a Fire Ecology, is actually the second Conversation Around the Fire event that we've had. Um, after the fires, uh, some of the groups uh, putting on tonight, some individuals got together and really wanted to do something to address the issues that have been raised and have a response in uh, things that are happening in our community, especially since the fires. And so came together and organized an event that happened in November. Uh, that event was focused on renter's rights and on uh, the increasing difficulties faced by folks that don't have homes, people that have lost their homes since the fires, people that have, didn't have homes before the fires, and renters, and how for all of them it's getting increasingly difficult. And that event was uh, very well received, so tonight we're having our second event focused on rebuilding in the fire ecology. And we're gonna have more events. Uh, there'll be another conversation likely in March uh, we don't have the exact date, but if you sign in at the front, uh, that's the way that we can let you know when the event is scheduled and what it will be about. And if you're interested in helping to organize the next event, you can let us know. Um, tonight, 
we will have uh, the speakers, and they're each going to be presenting for about five or ten minutes, just get their main points out, and we want to get the, the opportunity for them all to present. That's why we're going to withhold our questions and comments until they've all presented, and then um, we will have the time for the questions. And at 8 o'clock, we will wrap up, and that will be a time where folks can stick around, uh, mingle, go check out the tables, and we're going to also invite folks to two facilitated discussions across in the rooms, across the way, for folks that want to share more, and also that's a way to connect up with us if you want to get involved in the next <coughs> event. And if you didn't feel like something didn't be covered tonight, you want to see that come out in the future event. So uh, without further ado, we're going to start with Dan Wade of United Policyholders. I want to invite him. Let's welcome Dan Wade. Good evening, so I'm Dan Wade, uh, you know, with United Policyholders, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak about uh, our organization, what we do, a little bit about the insurance process, and then I was also asked to speak a little bit about uh, what we can expect going forward in terms of the insurance market in this area. So a little bit about our, our organization, uh, we're a nonprofit 501c3. <coughs> We've been active doing disaster recovery work with a focus on insurance since the Oakland Hills fire. Uh, a lot of our work gets done by volunteers who've been through our programs. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, amazing Oakland fire people come out and help us with our workshops and tabling up here and other events. <coughs> so I really want to thank them for paying it forward to the folks who are dealing with uh, this unfortunate situation here. Um, <coughs> we also are lucky enough to have a lot of uh, institutional knowledge on insurance. We have a lot of uh, insurance attorneys and claim professionals who donate their expertise to us so that we can fulfill our mission of empowering the insured, being a useful a voice and information resource for insurance consumers. Uh, we're, oh, before I leave this slide, I, I do want to mention that we have a lot of great partners in the community, um, including everybody here tonight. Um, but Legal Aid of Sonoma County, uh, California Rural Legal Assistance, the City and County of Sonoma, or City of uh, Sonoma and the City of Santa Rosa have all been great partners for us, and uh, we uh, really uh, are thankful that we've been invited into the community to help. So we run three programs. Uh, our Roadmap to Recovery program is, is the program that we are uh, implementing here uh, in Sonoma County. Um, our goal is to help people with insurance issues, to be a reliable information resource, to uh, help people overcome obstacles uh, and point them in the right direction if they need to find professional help. Uh, our Roadmap to Preparedness program is something that we do when we're not actively responding to a disaster. Our message there is to promote resilience so that when people are in a situation uh, like this, they are hopefully better prepared by having the right type of insurance coverage, hopefully not being underinsured. Um, and then we also do a lot of advocacy work uh, at the state level with the insurance commissioner, with regulators um, in other states, uh, with legislators, um, taking the lessons that we learn in disasters and the problems that we identify and trying to fix them. So our Roadmap to Recovery program is pretty um, it's multifaceted. Um, has anyone here been to one of our workshops in the, uh, in the community? Okay, so that's one of, of, of our, pro our uh, programs is to uh, do public town hall style workshops where we uh, go through a curriculum, help people with uh, insurance issues and give them kind of an orientation on the road to recovery. Uh, we're gonna be doing our fifth workshop uh, in, uh, here in Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa High School, it's on Thursday from six to eight. I have flyers over at the table, so if anyone's interested or you know somebody who would benefit from that, please pass the information along. Uh, we also have a website, which is a library of uh, samples and examples, uh, all kinds of wisdom on the claim process. The website is uphelp.org. We have a North Bay Fire specific webpage there on the homepage 
where we're putting up notices, um, you know, everything that we learn, try to keep it updated as information becomes available. <coughs> the fine print. So what makes us unique is that we don't take money from insurance companies and we don't sell insurance. So our, uh, you know, our hearts are pure and our goal is just to be helpful and not, we're not trying to sell you anything and then we don't have an ulterior motive. Um, we also don't give legal advice, um, even though uh, I'm an attorney by training and many of the issues that arise in the insurance uh, claim are legal in nature because it is a legal contract. Um, we have to steer clear of, of giving legal advice, but we can give general guidance and I think for most people, uh, hopefully that's sufficient. And then uh, we do have sponsors that are listed at our website. We don't warrant or endorse any of them. So for anyone who's dealing with an insurance claim, particularly a total loss from a wildfire, uh, our sage advice is that it is a marathon, not a sprint. It's a process that is ripe with all kinds of um, conflict. There are a lot of important decisions made. There's lots of money coming from different places. And so what we like to um, remind people is that it, it, you may be feeling under pressure to settle quickly or or to um, make decisions quickly, but you really actually have quite a bit of time. Um, we also want uh, people to understand that the insurance process is a business negotiation. It is not like the commercials that we're probably used to seeing. Uh, there's no magic wand, things don't go back to normal in an instant. It's a, it's a very long, complicated process, and there's a lot of work that the individual uh, homeowner or policyholder has to do in order to get paid. So uh, for those that are, are dealing with uh, this fire, um, a couple of important things that I want to point out. Uh, one is that uh, on this time issue, you have 24 months at a minimum set by law to re collect replacement costs on the house. So that is probably not as much time as what a lot of people will need, but it is certainly a, um, a good uh, sort of guidepost so that you don't feel like three months out from the fire you should be any farther along than you already are. Um, and then you also have two months um, of the additional living expense coverage. So for those of you who are, are using that to live somewhere else while you're figuring out what to do or while your home is being rebuilt, um, the, mi the minimum standard set in law is that you get 24 months. Uh, I get this question a lot, and I think we're going to talk a bit about this uh, throughout the night um, because of, of where some of the houses were located and where people might be in their lives and whether they really do want to go through rebuilding or if they want to rebuild uh, somewhere else, they want to buy something else. California law doesn't allow people to collect their full insurance benefits and take them to a different place, and that's not something insurance companies want to volunteer. It takes some work, but it's something that I think is important, and it's, it's I think, a popular uh, discussion. Um, let's see here. Uh-oh, I think we're blocked here. There we go. Um, okay, so this is, uh, I'll skip that for now. So code upgrades is gonna be something I think relevant to this discussion of rebuilding um, because uh, their building codes have changed. Um, a lot of folks wanna rebuild green. A lot of folks were gonna wanna rebuild with fire resistant materials. And so the code upgrade part of the claim is, is something we can talk about in more detail, uh, but it is an important part of the process, and it's, it's the money that's allocated in your insurance policy to do those types of things, to rebuild something that's a bit different than what you had before, to either to meet current code or because you want to do um, something that's more fire resistant or more uh, sustainable. So this is an example of where you'd find that coverage in a policy. It's down at the bottom on this policy. So this person has $75,000 of building code upgrades on a policy that is written for $300,000. So that's just an example. Um, so for those that are in the negotiation process uh, and trying to figure out how to connect all the buckets of coverage and get the maximized settlement, um, it's going to be very important to find professional help. 
Um, I know that contractors and professionals are in short supply here, but that is probably the best way to maximize an insurance claim. Um, and the reason for that is that the insurance company uh, is going to give you uh, something that's generated by their computer, and it may not account for all the things that you're entitled to, and it isn't going to be as flexible, uh, I think, as, as many people will want it to be. And, and the, the message here really is that when you're going through a claim, whether it's like your routine auto fender bender or a building a house that's been totally destroyed from a wildfire, it is your job to prove it um, to the insurance company what you owe. So it does take some work, and that's what we're here to help you do. Um, so I, I'll, I gotta wrap up because I'm almost out of time here, but um, one of the issues that, that I've been getting asked a lot about is what are we gonna do in the future? Are the insurance companies gonna non-renew everybody? Is it gonna be hard to buy insurance because we've had a, a tremendous wildfire here? The answer is for the people that have been through the fire, they'll get one renewal at the next renewal. And the idea is that while the house is being rebuilt, you shouldn't have to be shopping around for insurance coverage. So that, that is one uh, protection that exists for, for if you have lost your home. Um, for the rest of us, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult question. It's something that our organization is working on uh, with the insurance commissioner and there's some legislation introduced recently. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it remains to be seen, but um, we have some resources on our website that can help with that if that problem does arise. I'll just give you the URL one more time, and uh, I'm out of time, so I'll be here to answer specific questions. We have a little bit of a change. We actually have three illnesses of key folks here tonight. Um, so Julie Combs is uh, not going to be able to make it, and Edward Willie is not going to make it, and Laura Niche is also ill. But we do have replacements, so um, Sunny Galbraith is going to uh, be presenting for 350 Sonoma, and uh, she's our next speaker, so I think we've got the... Our, the uh, document queued up for the PowerPoint. We also have a number of folks that have come in and are probably looking for seating. So I want to invite folks to let them know it doesn't look like there's any open seats from the entryway, but over here you can see there are some. So if you can, raise your hands if you have empty seats near you, and then uh, folks can find their way in. Um, okay, so uh, here's uh, Sunny Gulbrook from 350 Sonoma. Out, I was speaking about an hour ago. <laughs> I had to get my son set up with his homework and brush my hair and everything. Here I am. So I am uh, likely less prepared than Laura was, but I have been working on this so I can speak um, with a fair amount of knowledge. Um, so what we see here on my singular slide is 350 Sonoma. We're a climate action group in Sonoma County. And it is a document that we work together with many other environmental groups, um, energy consultants, solar folks, and also uh, labor advocacy groups to come up with a vision for how people who would like to rebuild green might do that and some, some guidance um, and, and principles on that. And so after the fires, um, our group came together with you know, many other groups and we were thinking how can we best support those that lost their homes make it e and, and that would like to rebuild green but not have it be an increased financial burden or increased red tape. So that was really the motivation behind our work. And so in meeting with our <coughs> groups, we came up with several principles. Um, and we recognized that a lot of people wanted, want this anyway. And as we were meeting with other groups, many other groups were like, yeah, we want to help people do this as well. Because we're looking at our climate impact and everything that we care about in this, in this area. So um, what we have here, and maybe we'll scroll, if you could scroll down. It's not actually on a PowerPoint slide. There, perfect. Um, we, uh, maybe I'll save this first. We 
been meeting some with Sonoma Clean Power, and um, happy to say that In the Works is a program that Sonoma Clean Power is putting together to offer people financial assistance to build to a higher code. So a, a more energy efficient code and who might want to put solar panels on their homes or have all electric net zero energy homes. So that is in the works. So stay tuned and tune into Sonoma Clean Power for that. Um, let's see, what else? So in, in our recommendations and our uh, looking at what would be a more efficient home, we wanted to promote zero net energy homes with solar powered sustainable design elements. Um, Things, things such as electric heat pump based water heating, air heating, cooling, passive solar design, and building to the new 2019-2020 codes, which are very energy efficient. And then promote the use of sustainable fire resistant building materials. Um, promoting wise resource management, and I had a wonderful conversation with um, two people from Santa Rosa Water, and I heard that they're implementing a program where they're actually, they found some money to hire a design, um, landscape design person to make several different options for water efficient design so that people who rebuilding could actually use those already created uh, water efficient designs. So that actually, I put a little check by that. I was like, yes, that's happening. Awesome. Um, and then promoting sustainable communities affordable housing. We've also been meeting quite a bit with labor groups, um, and I think Mara will need to talk later, um, and North Bay Jobs, so Mara's with North Bay Jobs with Justice, a number of labor and environmental groups thinking how can we support the rebuild effort in a way that is also very good for our local workers and good for our local economy and builds the local economy and workers. So we're very much in support of that. And let's see what else I might have to say here. So yes, it's just our hope that our community can emerge from this crisis stronger than before and experience the benefits of increased infrastructure resilience to climate change that such green homes would bring. Have a stronger local workforce, lower operating costs for homeowners, people that choose to rebuild green, and get this financial incentive will also benefit in the future from lower energy bills and lower carbon emissions. So if we're looking at things that can make our area more resilient, we're contributing less greenhouse gases if, if we're supporting people and rebuilding green. And then lastly, a stronger and more resilient local economy. a lot of what you're hearing here. Uh, for example, the Rebo Green Expo, as far as like getting those building materials that you might be interested in, living earth structures. You can check out these tables to get ideas. I think David Harrison's over here with some fire resistant materials. So you can get some building materials as well as the uh, financial incentives uh, and support from uh, our local government. The county's Office of Sustainability has some materials right here in the back. Um, for the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program, there's resources. So check out the tables for some of the uh, handouts about the resources. And then I next want to uh, welcome, you know, as we're working towards building that resilient rebuild and recovery at a, a vision that's a higher, better uh, place than where we were before, I want to invite Mara and Tara of Jobs with Justice to uh, comment on this. I don't have a nifty PowerPoint for you, so you'll just have to look at me. <laughs> um, I wanted to give a little bit of context about what Jobs with Justice is on the off chance that there's folks here who haven't worked with us or seen us at events before. Uh, North Bay Jobs with Justice, we are a workers' rights and very much here for our chapter in immigrant rights uh, coalition. So we are over 20 organizations. Um, both community and labor here across the North Bay. Our mission essentially is that we want to build an economy that works for everyone. 
And what we think that looks like is making sure that people have a livable wage, have real meaningful access to health care benefits, not just a plan in your office that you can't afford for the only have emergency benefits. Um, and uh, also ensuring that people have the right to collective bargaining agreements. And I think, you know, more so than that, we also see that workers are more than just what they provide for our economy and the things that we need to not just survive but thrive, we need uh, more than what we get at our work site. And so at North Bay Jobs with Justice, we try to think holistically about what that means, what livability means, how we uh, get the things that we need to take care of ourselves and our families and show up for each other in the community. So beyond just your typical supporting workers who are maybe uh, working on their union contracts or fighting to form a union, or supporting the great initiatives out there like SB 562, which guarantees health care for all. Um, we also work on uh, things like environmental justice and um, a really exciting food access campaign. And you might have heard the Zero Waste campaign uh, this past year and started to see the Recology trash cans and dumpsters show up, which is really exciting and part of the work we've been doing. And we do that, again, because we think that everything is interconnected. And so we're really excited to be here um, among a, a host of wonderful folks talking about an array of things in the rebuild and recovery because um, this is a, a really important opportunity in our community. Um, right now, one of the most important things that we're, we're doing among many campaigns is we put together a work group that um, is uh, over a dozen environmental organizations, labor, community, student, faith, who are coming to the table to bring their agenda. So for instance, 350 Bay Area brought that piece of paper that you saw that they've been working on. So folks are coming forward with their own agendas, but also coming together to figure out what does a true, just, equitable, and sustainable recovery actually look like? How are we not just rebuilding the same where we already had uh, a major housing crisis um, where we had uh, class and racial inequality, um, you know, and so forth, but how are we rebuilding better? And so we've put together quite an extensive platform and our tables over there, we'd love to share it with all of you and we um, are sharing it also with the different platforms like the uh, city council goal setting group uh, meetings. But you know, one thing that we wanted to point out is that in order to ensure that our rebuild is just, we have to also be thinking about who are the folks that are the most uh, vulnerable and most impacted. And right now, that's our immigrant community. No, it's the seniors. So I, uh, and, our, and our seniors, absolutely. Um, so what we found um, after you know, doing extensive research, not just reading studies and articles, about what post-natural disaster cleanups look like around the country, but um, also actually having interviews with people who did the work in the post-disaster cleanups, um, was that where there are rampant exploitation of immigrant workers, that immigrant workers do a majority of the cleanup and of our rebuild. Um, many economists estimate that we will need 6,000 workers every year for the next three years in order to do our rebuild. And um, hopefully you understand that that means that we have a pretty big labor shortage and immigrant workers and particularly undocumented workers are going to be filling that. So I want to paint a picture of what post-natural disasters look like for those workers. Um, in surveys of studies after Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, and now recently Harvey and Irma, 70 to 80 percent of respondents in random sampling said that they were never compensated for their wages. Um, oftentimes, uh, after completing the jobs, the employee employers would never return, would disappear, and never come back to the work site. Um, up to 90% said that they were never paid for overtime, and at least 30% of workers did 100 hours of work in one week. Furthermore, 85% of respondents never received any official safety trainings, including 60% who said they were never given any proper safety gear, specifically respiratory gear for chemicals and mold. And I can tell you that um, just in the cleanup alone, we know for a fact that three women went to the ER who were undocumented immigrant workers covered in rashes because they were doing fire cleanup in Santa Rosa without any proper gear had no proper equipment, and uh, there are uh, hundreds of workers still waiting to get paid for some of that cleanup. 
So, um, you know, what we, when we look at places like Katrina, when we look at places like New York, they are still um, in some pretty scary places in terms of poverty rates and um, thousands of folks who were never paid for their work, all mostly immigrant. <coughs> And I just, you know, we want to call that to attention and we want to make sure that any kind of recovery and rebuilding work that we're doing centers those voices. And those folks are also being still heavily impacted by the fire in terms of seeing evictions, um, unaffordable wages, not access to just hours and so forth. So that's a lot of the work we're doing. Please stop by our table. We can talk for another hour. Uh, but come see some of the policy stances that we're doing and we have this great one pager on things that folks can do but the most important thing is that you all can get educated on making sure that you're holding the subcontractors who are doing the rebuilding either on your homes or friends homes accountable making sure that workers aren't getting paid under the table that they're on the payroll and you can um, go to California State License Board online to ensure that the subcontractors are actually licensed. Thanks. Yeah, so next we're going to hear from Ray Krause. He's a former environmental planner who worked for the County of Sonoma's planning department and has a lot of uh, information to share. Thanks. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about how did we get ourselves into this predicament. Um, I guess it's with the idea that if we uh, don't learn from history, we're bound to repeat it. And perhaps by looking at history, we can understand a bit about the tools by which land use decisions are made. Um, do we have the PowerPoint? What's the name of it? Uh, planning. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. That's the one. So the, the, the burning question is how did we end up building so many houses where they burned down? Um, and I guess the dilemma is is it possible uh, to achieve the common good? Um, land use decisions are dominated by a, a, uh, an attitude of private property rights. I have the right to do anything I want with my, my land. Um, and when I look at this picture, it's a house I drove by frequently in, over the years. Um, should I have to pay uh, taxes to protect that home because it's placed in a place that's indefensible? Should I have to pay higher insurance rates uh, because this house is going to burn down because it wasn't thoughtfully uh, built? Um, or should there be some land use regulation or some means by which the public collectively uh, can establish rules that uh, make the outcome more equitable? Uh, so, Land use regulation is really the balance between the public trust and private property rights. And it's driven like all things in this world. We always say follow the money. It's driven by who pays and who profits. Um, public trust are the, uh, the air we breathe, the water that falls from the sky, the land that we all walk on, the animals and the plants that occupy the landscape that we share. Um, all of those things are affected in some way or another when someone exercises their property, private property rights. So taking a quick look at history, how did the planning and land use regulation develop? We started with simple public nuisance controls. Um, there was a development early zoning. Post-World War II, um, with the soldiers coming back, we had a huge building boom. Um, and finally, there was a response to that building boom because it kind of went out of control. And beginning in the 1970s, we had uh, legislation from our state and that uh, brought more thoughtful regulatory regulation of uh, uh, development. So that included uh, the requirement for general plans, general land use plans, 
subdivision requirements, both as to where they could be located and what sort of infrastructure they had to provide. Um, planning consistency, when you have a general plan, then the development that occurs needs to be approved in a manner that's consistent with that plan. And then uh, came along the California Environmental Quality Act that really said, uh, what are the elements of the public trust? What are the elements of the common? And, and how are they impacted by the, the development of our uh, landscape? So just uh, really quickly, public nuisances were really uh, looking at things like tanneries and slaughterhouses and, and, and obnoxious uses that needed to be isolated from other, other uses. Early zoning um, simply divided the landscape into different districts, um, residential districts, commercial districts, industrial districts, and set forth regulations on the kinds of uses that could occur in those districts, and then the, the physical limits on those, the height, the bulk, the setbacks, um, and things like that. Um, zoning was largely limited to, to uh, cities and, and urban areas. And much of the land use control was, was delegated to the developers to establish limits on who could live there or what the houses could look like and covenants and restrictions, um, many of which uh, have been deemed illegal or unconstitutional. Um, limits on, on uh, religion, and ra racial, racial limits and religious limits on who could occupy a, a development. Post-World War II, veterans came home. There was this huge promotion of, of uh, housing. Um, I think the um, Sonoma County timber was clear-cut during that period. We had a tremendous uh, uh, destruction of our forests in a very, very short period of time between 1945 and 1965. Uh, it was promoted by federal loan guarantees, easy access to mortgages, uh, decisions without much public insight, mostly uh, the old boy network making decisions in the bar after the city council meeting. Uh, taxes brought in financing for public in infrastructure that uh, supported the development and it led to unregulated development. Um, Some of the decisions in Sonoma County that, that came through that, uh, that kind of uh, regulated. Um, I had the great fortune of, of uh, working with Thomas Cordell, uh, the late Tom Cordell, who was uh, in the 50s the planning director in the 40s and 50s, I guess, of the city of Santa Rosa. And he described the decision for putting Highway 101 through town when, when the the, the decision was made to create a freeway. The merchants in town insisted that they would lose business if we rerouted the, the uh, freeway around the city. So it had to go through the middle of town in order that travelers would stop and, and spend their money. There was a tremendous competition between county and city. Uh, a lot of development was, was uh, placed outside of the control of the city, outside of the city limits. Um, both because the development requirements were less strict and, and also because the county wanted the taxes and the city wanted the taxes. So I remember Tom telling me that when Cottingtown Shopping Center was first proposed, he talked to the merchants of the city. That was in the county at the time, it was not in the city. And he talked to the downtown merchants and he said, this is going to take up all of the retail development space for the next 15 years, 20 years. And they couldn't get themselves organized enough to influence the outcome of that decision, and sure enough, the city, the city center declined, uh, and and the development uh, moved out of the city. Montgomery Village was built outside of the city. Um, there was ample uh, taxes for public funding of infrastructure, both through. Um, Property, property taxes and bond issues, storm drainage. I don't know if you've looked at your uh, property tax bills, but for years we had zone one, zone two, zone three. All of the storm drainage that supported the development of these subdivisions was paid for by the public, not by the developer. 
Uh, Spring Lake, this beautiful park that we love, paid for by the public, not to create a park, but to prevent Montgomery Village from flooding. So it's a, it's a flood retention basin. Um, Warm Springs Dam is, is, is still on our, on our taxes. So I think there's a failure to recognize that the value of property depends upon the public investment. Are we going to spend money to build roads, provide water, provide drainage, to develop uh, sewers that will allow this property to be used in some way? And that's where the value comes. The, the value is not intrinsically in the property except for its ecological ecological value. And we as citizens should have the opportunity to choose who's, where we can invest in infrastructure most efficiently. Uh, perhaps not in fire zones, perhaps not in flood zones, perhaps not on landslides. There are a lot of, of places where, where development has occurred uh, where the public pays and the, the people that built the development profit. So when I came uh, in 1970, 90% of Sonoma County was zoned unclassified, one acre minimum. So you could go to the county surveyor and file a map and break off a, a one acre lot uh, anywhere you wanted to, and all you had to do was file a map. Uh, there were no infrastructure requirements, uh, minor subdivisions, anybody could split their property into four pieces so long as they were bigger than one acre. You didn't have to necessarily prove that there was water. You had to prove there was access. That was pretty much the limit. They had a bigger parcel and wanted to make more lots. It was called a major subdivision. Uh, so here's some examples of, of what we got. This is um, this, this. Here we go. Um, this is Highway 101. This is Stony Point Road. This is Meacham Road. This is the county dump. This is Happy Acres. <laughs> um, this one is a little, is also interesting. This is Sonoma State, Petaluma Hill Road. This is the city of Rotary Park that has, um, wasn't there when these parcels were developed. This is Cannon Manor. Both Happy Acres and Cannon Manor are, um, lacked uh, sewer systems, there are individual wells, individual septic systems. When you flush your toilet, it ends up in your neighbor's sink. Um, so who's going who's to pay for bringing in public services? And now there's a, a, a difficult, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if somebody here may know, um, I think there was an attempt to bring sewer, uh, sewer system, sewer service to the uh, to Cannon Manor. One of the best tools was Greenbelt Alliance's assistance in uh, bringing to us community boundaries. Here's Fulton Road, Hall Road, Highway 12. Uh, urban growth boundaries are, are one of the few tools that have really uh, constrained growth uh, in Sonoma County. Um, and I think it's interesting because it was a public initiative, was it not? So you know, you'll notice that those, those, the, the tool that I find is most probable to, to help ourselves shape our own community are public initiatives that are voted for by the people, not laws that are drafted by the legislature or by, the, the, by government. So in the 70s, we came along with modern regulatory controls. Uh, in the academic world, architecture departments started teaching urban planning. Uh, the, county, the state required general plans. Uh, they required the subdivisions and development be consistent with those general plans. Uh, subdivisions were required to, to have infrastructure. Uh, and there was an opportunity for not so much old boy decisions, but more public involvement. Uh, general plan is a, a whoops. General plan is a vision for the future growth. It has a bunch of elements: a land use, where do you put houses, where do you put factories, where do you put commercial uses, transportation, where are the roads, what public transportation is there, paths, bikeways, 
um, housing, how much population are we going to have and have to accommodate. Uh, we still haven't figured out how to manage population growth, so all plans basically have to accommodate the, uh, the projected growth in, in population. Conservation and open space are those public trust uh, characteristics of the landscape. How does development affect a landscape? Uh, do we put houses on landslides? Do we put houses in fire zones? Or do we pick more appropriate places for them? Noise, safety, air quality. Um, most recently, there's been an addition to of environmental justice. Do, do you uh, put all your factories or all your potentially polluting uh, uses in low-income communities, or, or can you find better places for them? Along with the development of planning came the, the development of environmental planning. Uh, this is a, a, a whole new way of looking at the world that didn't really exist. The California Environmental Quality Act was adopted. Um, it required that we identify public uh, trust resources and figure out how they're going to be impacted by development and mitigate those impacts to prevent them from occurring. Um, academic world, instead of just, um, sorry, instead of urban planning uh, as a part of architecture, began to take uh, their environmentalists, their, their natural scientists, and involve them in planning decisions. Uh, and uh, CEQA required what's called maximum feasible litigation if you identify um, damages to the public trust resulting from a proposed project, the, the, the uh, project is required to minimize or to mitigate those to the maximum feasible extent. One of the biggest things that came out of CEQA is the requirement for public notice and disclosure and a greater, much greater level of, of uh, public participation. Um, when a project is first proposed, uh, there's a scoping session where the public is invited to say these are the things, these are the aspects of the public trust that we think are important to be considered as we, we uh, promote this development. Um, another example of the public writing legislation is the Coastal Act, um, along with urban boundaries. It's probably one of the greatest planning tools that we've ever had. And again, I think it's interesting to note that it was. Uh, written by and promoted by and adopted by the citizens and not by, the, by government. Um, and then, of course, at the same time, um, our favorite President Nixon was presided over the federal government's adoption of the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, the Rare and Endangered Species Act, and creation of the EPA. So all of a sudden, we had a whole lot new, uh, more uh, new tools and different ways of, of managing them. So uh, when I came to Sonoma County, there was an effort to build a general plan. Um, there was a legal case in Mendocino County where um, uh, a project was enjoined by court uh, because they could not demonstrate that it was consistent with the general plan because the county didn't have a general plan. <laughs> well, this made a lot of cities and counties very nervous, and all of a sudden there was a uh, a, a whole new opportunity for employment for environmental planners up and down the state and the creation of a bunch of general planners. Uh, almost simultaneously, uh, the state Environmental Quality Act was initially applicable only to public projects. When you made a school or a highway, uh, the environmental consequences had to be uh, accounted for. Uh, the court said, well, when a government approves a private project, they also have an obligation to look at how it affects the public trust. So all of a sudden, planning departments up and down the state were saying, we have to do these things called environmental impact reports and initial studies. Uh, we have to figure out how to mitigate. Um, and again, there's a whole new uh, uh, level of, of public participation. So how were these things greeted in Sonoma County? We had a recall. <laughs> the Taxpayers Association, the Farm Bureau, the Realtors all said, you can't tell me what I'm going to do with my land. Again, we balance 
away from the public trust. Uh, Supervisors Gordon and Nicole Rico, the planning department was dismantled. Uh, all of the uh, prior knowledge, all of the accumulated knowledge of the, from the people who created the county's first general plan was discarded. Um, shortly after Prop 13 came along, uh, which severely limited, okay, uh, I'm going to run over just a little bit, okay, not all of them. Uh, Prop 13 just, just uh, really severely limited public revenues to the government. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it seemed like it was an anti-government, the beginning of the anti-government uh, public um, attitude. Um, the, the, the one thing I do want to point out on Prop 13, there was when, when prior to Prop 13, if your neighbor developed his property, if you had an apple ranch out by Sebastopol with 100 acres, and your neighbor developed a subdivision of four houses per acre, and the value of that subdivision with four houses per acre was astronomical, the assessor would look at that and say, well, you're adjacent to him. This is your comparable. Even though you're not intending to develop your property, your property taxes are going to have to be equivalent to the developed property. And when I worked in the county, I, I'll, I'll never forget the, the number of, of couples in the 70s and 80s, in their 70s and 80s, that came in and said, we can't pay our taxes, we have to break off some land to pay our taxes. Um, so Prop 13 did do some good things, um, but it also extended this, uh, this tax benefit to commercial properties. Uh, to corporate owned properties, um, so uh, as opposed to individually owned properties. Um, and then with the, the decline in property tax, it shifted the competition between counties and cities to this uh, sales tax. So we had ended up with Corby Avenue and Automobile Mall, um, which was built in the county, later annexed to the city but basically so that the county could accumulate those, those property taxes. In 1978, we had a new board. Helen Rudy was elected. Uh, Eric Konishoffer was elected. The governor appointed Brian Kahn. We had a re-vote majority who uh, turned the tables. They did adopt the new general plan. It did call for uh, city-centered growth, but um, it's kind of a loophole in, it, in the projects that are uh, simply have to show that they comply with particular standards, like a building permit. The walls are so so tall, the studs are such a size, the plumbing is such a way, are called ministerial. There's no discretion. It's like a checklist. Either you meet the checklist or you don't. Discretionary projects are a use permit. Can I put a machine shop on this parcel? next to my neighbor's home. Um, and one of the things that the county did is, is create uh, uh, loopholes in, in CEQA and by making things like new vineyards uh, ministerial instead of discretionary. So you can go in and you can cut down on Oak Woodland and you can plant a, a new vineyard and you are pretty well exempt from the environmental quality. Act. So, that, that was, again, you know, one, of the, one of the failures. Uh, one minute. Uh, real quickly, uh, there, there were particular requirements for fire hazard. You had to figure out where the fire hazards were greatest and, and uh, how, how you could mitigate them. Um, one of the mitigations in Fountain Grove was to build a fire station. <laughs> so this, how did this all turn out? Well, this is a picture from my what I call my sunset deck. Um, this is this ridge in front of us here um, is just uh, west of Calistoga Road. Uh, this uh, burning ball of fire is uh, Lark Field and Wiki Up. Uh, and here it is moving down into Coffee Park and down into Fountain Grove. 
these little white candles on the top of the ridge are, are uh, the foothill subdivision um, that when it was proposed, we did an environmental impact report and pointed out that it was extreme fire danger. The night of the fire, um, after laying out our houses and evacuating our families, I sat on the deck and watched its progress and recalled when I worked for the county in the 70s, mapping all of the historic fires. We went to the Department of Forestry and they had paper maps showing where everything had previously burned. So this crosshatch area is where we had previous burns. And I described this to one of Chris Schaefer, one of my friends who was there with me. And uh, when he left Monday morning, this was Sunday night, uh, he went and visited a GIS guru of his who immediately built a map. And so these uh, colored points are the Tubbs fire. The, the, hatch, the hatch mark is 1964. And then it's also interesting to note that these same areas burned in 39 and 08. Um, this is a nice graphic that was in the Press Democrat. The, the reason these fires Please burned wrap repeatedly, up. you know, just one more minute. I'm almost there. Uh, uh, the function of topography and wind. The, the wind is funneled through these areas, bringing the fire down into uh, Rockfield and, and Wikiup and, uh, and, and Coffin Park. So it was a predictable outcome. This is another, just another map of the uh, Hanley fire with the Tubbs fire superimposed on top of it, and this was the outcome. <laughs> These are the homes that were lost in the city. It's uh, interesting to note that Fountain Grove is kind of an appendage up here. I remember in the late 70s when Bob Walters, the owner of that property, came to the county and said he wanted to develop it with urban density housing. And we told him, no, it's not a good idea. The only way you can do that is if you annex it to the city. And lo and behold, 20 years later, the city annexed it. It's kind of a weird appendage. But the county wasn't doing this. Here's uh, our field in Wikiup. The fire came down there and, and really hammered these areas. And here's Coffee Park. Uh, lots of homes lost in the county. Most of these parcels were created before the county general plan. So, um, when you get to how were these decisions made, I think it's an issue of who pays and who profits. Homeowners, whoops. Homeowners uh, were not made whole. How many people here lost their home or lost their rental units or were displaced? And how many of you are going to come out whole? <laughs> so, uh, renters really get hammered. The developers, built the property, built the houses in these areas where it was known to be uh, unsafe, uh, took their profits, disappeared. They have no financial obligation to make anybody whole. The banks are still paying our mortgages on houses that are burned down. Uh, the banks are protected. Uh, insurance companies are whole. We as taxpayers, of course, um, try to make up those shortfalls in the form of uh, FEMA F assistance. All right, can we can we wrap up? Yep. Yeah. Can you talk closer to the mic? <laughs> we can we can get to the rest at Q and A. Okay, I'll just finish this up. I think you can see this more quick more quickly in Houston. Um, the flooding in Houston was here to exactly the same thing. The, the, the house homeowners are, are not made whole. The uh, insurance companies are, we actually have a, a federal flood insurance program. Um, so who profits? You know, it, 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 it's, it's a simple equation. If you just follow the money, you can figure it out. Yeah. Um, and finally, as an environmental planner, I think it's, uh, important to understand that these fires are a huge catastrophe for urban areas, but for the natural landscape, they're really beneficial. 
And here's an example of a post-fire landscape in Lake County from a few years ago. And here's what it looked like the following spring. And that's my story. Right. And we had hoped to have Julie Copes here, uh, but she was ill to talk about the government role and a lot of that. But I think our next speaker, Terry Shore, has a lot of information that overlaps. And, you know, it really was a comment Julie Copes made that helped inspire some of tonight's themes. It's when she was directing staff at a city council member meeting, besides helping to make the permitting process go well, saying, for folks that want other options, that maybe don't want to go back to a spot that's been hit by fire over time. What, how are we supporting them to give them choices and options? And so that's part of what we wanted to do tonight is to have people have resources so that you have more options and you have choices and uh, you can do more with, with uh, more resources. So I just want to bring uh, Terry Shore from a Green Belt Alliance up to present a few more bits of information and then we're going to open it up to some questions and discussion and we'll still have a, a good amount of time for that. Okay, thank you very much June and I uh, thank everyone who was involved in sponsoring um, the event this evening. Um, my name is Terry Shore. I am the Regional Director for the North Bay from Greenbelt Alliance based here in Santa Rosa. And uh, for those of you don't, who may not be familiar with Greenbelt Alliance, we've been around a long time. We're based in San Francisco and work just in the nine Bay Area counties. So I'm in the North Bay. Our main office is in San Francisco and we have offices in the South Bay and the East Bay. And um, uh, Greenbelt Alliance is unique because we work in, on environmental issues and protecting the green belt around the Bay Area, but we also work to encourage and promote growth in the right places, because you can't save the green belt unless we have places to live close to town and near transit and shops. So that's kind of um, Green Belt Alliance's um, mission and approach, and me personally, um, I've been with Green Belt Alliance for three years, um, but I've been in Sonoma Valley um, for 30 years. And, you know, for the past 20 years, I've dedicated my life to environmental work and protecting the environment through policy, primarily, full-time at the local, state, national, and international level. And I was also, and have been a Sierra Club backpack leader for 20 years, um, taking people out into the wilderness. And so the reason I bring that up is because now, I'm into policy, I'm into the outdoors, but people here in this room and in our community have all different types of expertise. Some are educators, some are focused on climate change, some are leaders in the labor movement, some are peace advocates. We need all of us, so I'm just thrilled to be here with the panel and with all of you so that we can move forward together. So, um, I am going to talk about fire recovery and resiliency, mostly from a policy and planning perspective. Um, there are really two big buckets, if you want to call it that, um, in that arena. One is the landscape and one is the built environment. I'm going to talk a little bit about the landscape, but mostly about the built environment and what's happening on the ground. So. Is it just this arrow? Oh, okay. So, um, as we just heard, um, the, the fires um, burn thousands of open space um, lands, our parks, and a lot of ag land. And, you know, for the most part, a lot of these lands are going to recover because this is a fire adapted landscape. So, these areas have been burning for centuries. Um, so it's not that unusual, it's just that a lot more intense for a lot of reasons, um, including climate change. But a lot of it has to do with planning. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of uh, policy um, areas of green belts that actually help. So they're the community separators that we have in Sonoma County. And this photo, which is kind of cut off, 
um, is um, right next to Cloverleaf Ranch. It's called uh, Buzzard's Gulch in the Larkville Wickiup area, which burn, and there is a community separator there, which is a, essentially a green belt of low intensity. So yes, this area did burn, but it would have been a lot worse if we had sprawled into this area. So the community separators and the green belts will mostly uh, recover, and they also are one of the elements of having a more fire-resistant community. Um, part of the reason I bring up this slide is because there is a proposed luxury resort um, at this location before the fires where there would be um, high-end um, spa, resort, and hundreds of weddings. And it's right on the edge of the urban growth boundary in Santa Rosa. So um, everyone's probably happy that wasn't built before the fires. I don't know what's going to happen now. So this, again, is cut off, but um, this shows you our uh, landscape um, up in the Mayacamas in Sonoma Valley. And it did burn, um, but the land is already green and is a mosaic of color, and this land will really come back. Um, but one of the things we are um, talking about, um, uh, relevant to what June just said, you know, maybe there are folks who live out in the hills. This is a protected area at Glen Oaks Ranch. But maybe there are folks who live up in the hills that lost their house that may want to move into the city center. So, you know, we're trying to develop some voluntary options and incentives, um, working with our elected leader, leaders to explore some of these options. Um, one of them potentially could be a transfer of development rights. So right now we have the open space district. We all pay, pay sales tax and that purchases the development rights and conservation easements on farmland and large parcels throughout the county. There are about 100,000 acres protected. Well, what if we were able to purchase the development rights for somebody who's way out in the country, either they can't rebuild or they're not going to have enough money to rebuild, and we could fill that gap for them with the agreement that they're not going to develop anymore or subdivide anymore, and then put that, um, make that available to build in the city center and maybe provide incentives for higher density along the smart train or something along those lines. So there would be a benefit of protecting open space. You would help the homeowner, or the homeowner might want to move into the city center. So maybe we just don't build there at all, and we move it into the city center. So these are options that are still being developed, and they have been uh, done in different parts of California. And so we're working on that particular concept right now. So um, one thing everyone should be aware of is that there was a large uh, watershed collaborative, including Greenbelt Alliance and many other agencies and organizations led by the Open Space District. And tomorrow they will be presenting to the Board of Supervisors this um, pretty comprehensive um, plan for the natural landscapes and the many things that we can and do need to do to think about going forward to help our land recover, but also to um, think about the future and preventing it. So there's way too much for me to get into on this, and now I'm already down to three minutes. So um, I would urge you to go to the Board of Supervisors tomorrow if you want to learn more, or it is up on the website. So now talking about the burned areas, you know, we have Fountain Grove, which we already heard a bit about. So the, the, for recovery and rebuilding, we've got the burned areas like this in Fountain, Air, in Fountain Grove. And we've got, oops, and a lot of these lands, um, lots are in the process of being cleared. So you have lands that were burned and are going to just be replaced with homes that were there before. There's also undeveloped lots in the burn area that we need to have a conversation about. And then we have new development. There's going to be a big surge of new development in Sonoma County. And we need to make sure that it is in the right places, within our urban growth boundaries near transit. So there are a number of ordinances that have already been passed by the county and the city that you probably heard about on the news. For, so for a rebuild, in Coffee Park or Fountain Grove, if someone wants to rebuild their house right now, yes, go for it. They will be able to go to the permit office, get a permit, and build. They will be able to build to current code. They will have to upgrade to current code, whatever that is for green building and fire. Um, and they'll also be able, in both the county and the city, to build bigger. 
So and on the one hand, it's great that people can rebuild and will be able to rebuild fast and do the best they can. On the other hand, we know from the Oakland Hills fire um, that up in the hills, uh, many of those homes were rebuilt to be 10 to 11% bigger. And that resulted in more fire risk because you have more bigger homes in the fire area. And it also led to more gentrification because now these property values are worth more. So there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do about that, but that is something that um, is happening and will happen. But I think it's going to happen slower than we think. There is a big push to rebuild, and I also appreciate what was said earlier tonight that it is going to be a marathon, not a sprint, but sometimes it feels like a sprint. And the county and the city are sprinting with policies and ordinances. Some, most are okay, some good, and some we need to watch. For example, okay, these are the good things. That will come later. Um, <laughs> so, for new development. Oh, before I go to new development, one thing about the rebuild is that there is a uh, great promise for incentives for greener building through Sonoma Clean Power. Um, they just released a draft plan at the Community Advisory Commission last week. Um, so that is available publicly to take a look at that. And they're talking about combining incentives, local, state, federal, up to maybe $25,000 per home. So I think the homeowners are going to be taken care of. One of the questions we have, this is a project to site in Fountain Grove, in the city of Santa Rosa, um, that Julie Combs is very concerned about. And the main reason that we're concerned about this is this is a senior center. So there's a proposal for, and it's been pretty much approved, there's just one last hurdle, to put a new senior project in the uh, senior center in the middle of the burned area with only one access route in and out. Really no changes to existing code because legally they only need to build to existing code. And so it, it, there was quite a discussion at the uh, Planning Commission and the Design Review Commission, um, but there's been no real discussion at the City Council level as how we want to approach new development in the burned areas. So that's a very important discussion, um, and we're going to run out of time so we can't get into it tonight, but tomorrow night at the Santa Rosa City Council, um, there is an item to agendize a discussion about new development in the bird areas, and that's thanks to Julie Combs and Chris Rogers and the mayor. So if you're interested in that subject right now, all they need to hear is, yes, we want you to have that discussion. Um, so I think I'll just jump into the new development, which is going to be coming fast and furious throughout Sonoma County, and maybe it's good, we need a lot of housing. Um, and if it is, we want it to be in the city centers. The green areas are all our community separators, the green belts that are protected. The ones in the middle, you can see Rona Park, Atati, Santa Rosa, the, the urban growth boundaries aren't on there, but that's where we want it. Um, and we can think about for new development, do we want to you know, upgrade? Do we want them to use greener building? Do we want them to be close to transit? So we have an opportunity, I think, a lot more opportunity to provide input going forward than to have a lot of changes about in the burned areas, particularly for homes that were burned down. So the, um, one of the things that I'm a little concerned about is this is the area around the airport called the, um, and there's a plan, the airport specific plan that is moving forward. And it's near the smart train, and that's all fine and good. But um, a couple of, like a week and a half ago, the board decided to expand the scope of work in this area to increase the amount of housing beyond what was previously anticipated. So that's something to keep an eye on. Some of this area does not have sewer and water. Some of it does. They're getting water from the town of Windsor. But when the town of Windsor agreed to put uh, uh, extend water, it was to help the commercial industrial site there to help the airport and to um, provide uh, water around the smart train. So again, maybe it's not going to be a bad thing, but we need to watch it because we don't want a brand new community sandwiched in between the urban growth boundaries of Windsor and Santa Rosa, I don't think. 
And if we do, then we have to think carefully about that because then that will create sprawl, um, higher fire risk, but maybe we want to protect green bu buffers elsewhere. So it's not entirely black or white, but these are the kind of things that are happening now. So you've got to watch those agendas and sign up for the Greenbelt Alliance email list if you want to hear more about it. The next thing is there are a number of dates coming up. The Sonoma County is putting together a fire recovery plan in the next month or so, and there are a number of dates that I couldn't get up on the screen. But starting on February the 6th, the board is going to be holding a, a, a whole session on housing, February 13th on natural resources, February 27th on safety net and infrastructure, and in spring of 2018, they will be bringing this fire recovery plan, which will be put together by their new fire recovery office, forward for approval, and then that goes basically to FEMA and the state to help get reimbursements. But this is kind of going to take the place of the Sonoma County General Plan update, which they were gonna do this year, is being pushed back, rightfully so. But now is the time to get engaged, get to know your supervisors, and get to know your elected officials. So, thank you very much. Great, so now comes the time for folks to, to ask questions, and uh, if you have a question, if you come right here, go ahead and stand up and just, we'll do a line here. And uh, well, if we have a lot of folks in line, then we'll probably Speaking need some limited. I'm trying to turn this on. Is it working? Yeah. 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 So um, we'll have folks line up. And uh, we see we have a lot of folks in line that will, you know, figure, uh, try to keep your question to a, a moment or two, a minute or two. And, uh, uh, and go ahead and you can ask a single person on the panel or the whole panel they can respond to your comment or question and give it like a yeah we're gonna we're gonna try to keep um the question and answer to three minutes so okay. questions okay so um i wanted to know probably from mr way um uh but about if we'd like to have people rebuild to the, the upcoming code improvements for, that are the 2019-2020 code, is there any chance that insurance would cover that if city and county haven't actually enacted a legislation to move that uh, effective date earlier? Does the city and county need to do that in order for people to get reimbursed? I don't know. Uh, it, it might depend on when the permit is pulled. So I'll look into it. But uh, would, it, would it help for the city and the county to have uh, changed their codes to, to adopt it earlier? Well, it, you know, it's it's going to be part of the negotiation because the insurance company is going to say we're only going to pay for what's the minimum that's required under the building codes. So it's, it's part of the negotiation. You have to, you know, whatever plan that you come up with, with with your builder, if it includes, you know, certain things, then that's, it becomes part of the negotiation. But I don't know if I have a clear answer on that. Hi, we have a resort that's been in my family for 104 years. Into the microphone. Um, and we're trying to make it more green and ecological with the rebuild, we were totally burned. And one of the things we're having great trouble with is we would like to promote and educate the public on incinerates and composting toilets, and we're getting nowhere with the county. How do we put more pressure to have this uh, legalized in Sonoma County? We're in the county, not in the city. <laughs> Sir, I, Terry Short Greenville Lights. Um, my understanding is the County of Sonoma has recently approved a pilot project or a test out at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center for composting toilets, which has taken them years to get. 
So I would say that it's not going to happen anytime soon, but um, if the, the, the test project out there meets the county's health standards, then perhaps in the future it will be easier to do. But right now, you cannot do it. Why can't they become the test? We can, but it's a lot of extra hoops. And as we're building, we're already encountering a ton of hoops. So I've just recently gotten in touch with the board of Soups and Mike McGuire and seen if we can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As was mentioned, the general plan update every 10 years is coming up, and Terry mentioned that it was a valuable tool. My question is, I think you were talking about the county because the city is very much trying to start a general plan update, and the city is, and so my question is, don't you agree that our participation in the general plan update of the city of Santa Rosa to incorporate all the things we're talking about taking it away from the city staff and making it a community-based general plan update is a good idea? Hi, yes, I have Sorry, a Can I respond really yeah. quickly? I mean, it's oh. yes, of course. But I also just wanted to add from the perspective of labor and, and deliberate rights, as we talked about tonight, that I have been really um, unpleasantly surprised to see how much of the uh, fire recovery conversation, um, particularly among like building a plan of our among our elected officials, um, is void of talking about um, the economic recovery and ensuring that we aren't creating sub poverty wages, uh, wage jobs in all of the jobs that are coming from the rebuild and recovery and being thoughtful about how many undocumented immigrants in our community um, are falling through the cracks of receiving aid, receiving support, and now even being able to stay in their homes um, as there are now waves of evictions because our housing crisis you know, went from insane to extreme. So uh, just wanted to also point out that one way that we can also be advocates is we are going to these meetings with the Board of Supervisors and the San Rosa City Council is to also say, I don't see wages and economic support and you know a thought about our immigrant community in any of these conversations, which even just looking at the lineup for the Board of Supervisors plan, there's nothing there. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, regarding the insurance and understanding that people that currently have coverage can keep their policy while they are building. But I'm understanding from the law firms that are suing PG&E that they're going to start um, suing and including uh, the slide and property values where many people will not be able to get insurance, potentially if they need additional funds to rebuild because their policies are not enough. So they may not be able to re rebuild just because of the inability to get coverage. That's one question. The next question was about zero net energy. Uh, there is no such thing as zero. And the Department of Energy has said that. And my next question is, in the open space protected areas, are there property taxes paid as revenue to help support the open space areas? So I have three questions, thank you. Well, on the insurance issue, so yeah, the uh, underinsurance is already revealing itself uh, to be a, a big issue here as it tends to be after many wildfires. But um, there are, and that's one of the, I think, appeals of the private litigation that's going on is a gap filler for folks that are underinsured. Um, FEMA assistance, small business association loans, that, that there's ways to create something, but it's true that many people will probably not be whole. Um, that's, I think, a slightly separate issue from um, what insurance companies are gonna do in this area once things kind of normalize again, and whether there are going to be, you know, insurance companies that completely pull out of the area, and that it's gonna be more difficult for people to find, find coverage, and uh, that's, it's, it's likely that that will, occur, but the Department of Insurance and legislators and our organization, we're working to try to keep the market from contracting in that way, um, but it has happened already in areas where there have been wildfires, so it's, it's something to 
to be aware of, um, but hopefully by the time that starts to happen, we will have come to some sort of solution. Property taxes collected on uh, conservation easements and uh, privately owned properties. Oh, um, so so it depends what kind of open space you're talking about. I mean, you're just talking about a conservation easement. Well, land trust and the easements. Right. Well, it depends if the person, it, like if they buy it outright. So if the Sonoma Land Trust or the Open Space District outright buys the land, no, I wouldn't think there would be any property taxes because it would be owned by the government. If you buy an easement, if the county or the land trust or someone buys the easement, you're basically buying the development rights for that piece of property. So the private property owner would continue to buy uh, to pay property taxes, but it would be relative to the value or the assessment of the property after those development rights have been removed. So they would be less, basically. Good evening. I love you all. Get to the question. I have a few thoughts that I hope question. you'll respond to. Question. I think we all learned in junior high school that we're the government and the government servants aren't exactly doing what we might like. I'd like to offer, for anybody that's interested, um, I have a flyer on living cactus fences, which the supervisors had me put one in at the uh, fairgrounds three years ago. They are a firewall, a food source, an erosion control, and much more, and they're really quite nice. The thoughts that I was putting together is, and I'm concerned about is, I'm, I heard that there's 5,000 homes that are scheduled to be built in Santa Rosa, but that, they're, that they signed an agreement that they're going to be all non-local, out-of-state, and even possibly non-Americans contracted to build these 5,000 homes. So you can respond to that one. i got two more things, and one is, um, let's see, yeah, PG&E um, really uh, has been set up to be dissolved and that started in San Bruno, and that's happening here. They had nothing to do with these fires. And uh, one question I guess I'd like to ask is, if you've ever heard of uh, StopTheCrime.net, it's probably one of the best sites on the internet regarding this, this topic, and I'd sure like to see the owner of StopTheCrime.net hold her own meeting like this so that other people can speak in more detail about serious concerns. And I'll finish by telling you that <clears throat> We all remember Ron Reagan and the Star Wars program, and that was supposed to be laser weaponized satellites to take out incoming bomb assaults. But instead, they have lasered our homes on behalf of Agenda 21, which is quite simply a military assault. And so, the last thing is, the question is, um, does, an, does an assault by the military complex uh, when does it become a coup? It becomes a coup when we pretend that we don't know what's really going on or ignoring the facts. Thank you. Uh, this question could be answered by any two or three of you, I think. Uh, I've approached the county and the city on multiple occasions now in public and by litter, asking them if they're keeping track of their difference between what they get in permit fees and property taxes and the cost of public infrastructure. The closest I came to an answer was from Peter Rabbit, who said, gee, in Petaluma, our median home price is 550,000. A house has to sell for a million one in Petaluma for us to break even on permit fees and taxes. That means everything they're building, everything they want to build, is a money loser. And what Mr. Krause had to say about the best things that happen, happen through citizen action, not because we're waiting on the city council or the, or, the, or the county. And I don't think these people are evil. I just think with Citizens United and the money that goes into it, people are electing people who are serving the developers, not the public. So if any of you know, any of you know, any, if you, any of you know who in the county government or the city government is keeping track of the potential costs of all their decisions, can anybody have a tally for that? 
I'd love to find it. Thank you. I get, you know, with, with uh, Prop 13, the, where, where we used to pay uh, for infrastructure from our property taxes, the, the, uh, with, the, with the re reduction in property taxes, those costs were shifted to the home buyer. So the last time I heard, I think that there's a fifty or $60,000 cost just to draw a permit before you build, pay, pay to build a house to pay for things like parks and schools and, and infrastructure. So, um, the answer to that is no. No one's keeping track because it's off by two to one. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a general acknowledgement that residential development does not pay for itself, but the cost of, of um, city services, of, of urban services, exceeds the, the uh, revenue from the, from the taxes. And that's, that's why we see such a push for, for commercial and, and, and sales tax uh, providing uh, uses. Anybody has the answer to my question? Yeah, I do. Okay, we'll take a few more questions. At 8 o'clock, we're going to break into the breakout sessions and the networking, and people can ask the speakers one-on-one -on -one if you have a follow-up at that point. Hi, I've been involved with a non-toxic building for 20 years. A lot of the materials that um, I promote and have promoted are not um, coded yet. So one of, one of the questions I had is I have been in connection in Sonoma County with brilliant minds, designers, contractors, architects, and it seems like the city council is not willing to ask what kind of information do we have to give. So I'm asking who I could talk to to start that process. The second question I have is, the um, mandatory, is there any mandatory uh, granny units set up so when these buildings get built that they, that the residents will have a, a secondary uh, income and a place for students, immigrants, seniors to live. So is there anything in the general plan or in the city council agenda at this point that it's doing that? I'm not sure of the details, but I believe there's recently been state legislation that makes it much more, uh, less difficult to get a, a permit for a granny unit. Um, but it's still at the, at, the, at, the, at the choice of the property owner. You have to want to build a granny unit. But if you would, would like to put an additional unit on your property, I think it's, it's become um, uh, less burdensome. It's an insurance problem, though. That's correct, and some of the urgency ordinances have streamlined permitting for ADUs and reduced or waived some of the fees, so in Sonoma County and the city both, there's a lot of, um, you know, remove, there's no mandates, but there are incentives to do it, and when it comes to green building, um, there are no mandates other than code, um, but as we mentioned earlier, Sonoma Clean Power is looking for incentives. Uh, particularly in the burn areas, and I think as we move along toward the next level of energy efficiency and green building, it will ramp up. So you need to talk to your elected officials and people in the green building community who are, you know, working with them. Have you, have you reached out to Conservation Action? Conservation Action is actually working with Sonoma Clean Power to help figure out what those incentives could look like. And I think they're actually probably a great, you know, one of our longest standing well, there's, environments. There's fire, um, totally fireproof building materials that are not being used. And I'm, I'm concerned that they're going to be basically... Can you have the mic, the please? Uh, there's fire, there's fire um, resistant, fireproof building materials that can be used for probably a little bit more money, but not that much more. And I don't see that the city council is, is basically saying, okay, if you're rebuilding, you must use these or at least support that process in some way. 
Yeah, so that's correct. Not they're, rebuilding. They're just requiring whatever is required under current code. Well, then why is that? We're out of time. Yeah. So, want to just let the last two people go? Yeah, yeah and then we're going to, you can sure. stick around and talk to folks individually at the tables, and then there are going to be two facilitated conversations across the hall. We'll announce that, but these are the last two. We'll make it quick, and then we'll break up for networking. Can I hold it? Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> 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 My name is Moshe Shafrir, I'm an architect. I developed the concept of fire resisting house, home. Here is a diagram how fire attacks the house. How most houses were burned through the attic, through the crawl space, or embers falling on the roof, igniting. A petroleum, petroleum made roof. Yeah. Now the building code addresses fire that starts inside the house and preventing the fire from expanding to a neighboring house. The building code doesn't address line of fire attacking 40 houses at once. So I hope the building departments, the planning departments, start thinking about it. I'm already in business for 36 years doing architecture. But I know the building code doesn't address the issues that were shown happening in the current fires. I live and practice architecture in Hillsburg. My home was closed. It was a miracle. There was no wind, so we survived. But I believe there's a different way to build houses. On Facebook, it was in Coffee Park, the first house was built, and I look, it was a much boxed fire trap. The same way, more combustible than before. The, hot, the older houses had dense wood, old growth wood. Now we use particle board that is 30% glue petroleum product. Particle board is very combustible. It's cheap, but burns much better than the previous houses that were built. So anybody who wants to build, talk to me if you want to be safe and not to build again. Yes, it's more expensive, but it's more, more, more expensive to be built again. So it's a way to build houses in, I would say, fire-resisting construction. There is no fire-proof construction. There is fire-resistant construction. Thank you. This is a statement, not a question. Please pay attention. Thank you. Phone number. You can just go up and ask him. Go on over and give it So yeah, I just also wanted to direct uh, folks, if you want his phone number, come and, come and get it from him. We're about to break. Uh, just want to, if there's a lot of information about materials and all that, there is this event, February 23rd. Lots of different folks with different materials and ideas, and you can get a lot of resources there. So it's at the table back here, February 23rd at the Veterans Hall. Okay. Hi, thank you. I do have a question. Um, <laughs> it'll come. Up. Oh. Uh, my question. One question I'm going to start out with actually is. Uh, the question from an inconvenient sequel is, what are you going to do now that you know? Okay, because this was one of the greatest, or so worst, uh, environmental events in the history of the world. From the standpoint of the size of the fire, and of the amount of fire, and the cost of everything. Um, so, that's, that's the question. But uh, I'm also going to point out is that the general plan updates uh, by law must be done when necessary. One of the elements is a fire mitigation plan within the safety. And it was left to the individual landowners. The entirety of the fire mitigation and the safety was left to the individuals. Just like the architect said, it's a, a fire is going to burn from the inside out and we're going to protect the house and that's going to protect the house next to it. No, this was a wall of fire that came across. And that's the purview of civil engineers. And I'm a civil engineer, and that's what we do. And the civil engineer is required to be the head of every single department in every single city and every single department across the state of California. 
Why? For this reason, to coordinate all the types of information. And it's not being done, so it's a violation of state law in every situation. Now they have the Office of Resiliency, brand new. Who's in charge? Civil engineer? No. Why not? Because they don't want to do this stuff. They don't want to have a coordinated effort that the community does regarding the land ownership, regarding the, the what's called the common enemy doctrine to protect against flood and fire and so on. It doesn't want to. So what are you going to do now that you have? Okay, so we're right at the 8 o'clock mark, which is when we actually wanted to be able to have some time for folks to visit the tables. And there is going to be a facilitated discussion for folks that want to talk about what are the solutions or ways they found to deal with the trauma of the fire. If you want to share in a discussion like that, straight across the hall, over there in room 4, they'll be having that discussion. And then also across the patio in room eight, for folks that want to talk about any topics tonight that you feel didn't get covered and you want to talk with others about it or maybe perhaps get involved in a future event planning, you can meet over there. Otherwise, just enjoy the, the other folks in the room and uh, if you have questions, you can come see me as well if any of that wasn't clear. Thanks for going on.